It's not every day that you get introduced by a living legend. Thank you, Dan Gable. Thanks for your inspirational leadership for wrestling and for Iowa and for Mitt Romney. Thank you, Scott County. Every time I ran for office, I won in Scott County. Thank you, Scott County. I'm proud to be back in Scott County today and here with this great Iowa business, Seven City Sod. You know, great Iowa company. You know, four years ago, Barack Obama came to Iowa and told us that we should believe in him. He promised to turn Washington, D.C. and around. And yet here we are today. Small businesses in this country are struggling to survive and face great uncertainty. Whether it's the nation's burdensome debt or the threat of increased regulations, costs, and higher taxes due to Obamacare, businesses don't have the predictability and stability they need to grow in this country. One thing is certain, that is, if elected, Mitt Romney as your next president, the potential for small business growth will become unlimited again. There are two competing visions for America's future. One only need look at the vision of Republican governors across this country to see what we've been doing the last several years. It started in Indiana with Mitch Daniels, and then in 2009, we elected Republican governors in Virginia and in New Jersey. And last year, in 2010, in the last election, we won in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And we've done it in each of those states. We've cut spending. We've lowered taxes. We've reduced burdensome government regulations and we provided business-friendly policies, and our states have come back. <laughs> Mitt Romney stands with us. He's got ambitious goals for 12 million more jobs and reducing the level of spending to less than 20 percent of the gross domestic product of this country. Unfortunately, President Barack Obama has a different vision, one of his own state of Illinois, governed by his buddies. And you know what Illinois is like. They have more debt per capita than any other state. They have the biggest unfunded public employee pension system in America, and they're $4 billion behind in paying their bills on time. Well, yeah, they did send a bunch of governors to prison. <laughs> well, in fact, you know, they, they say that one guy, in, they're standing in the chow line in Illinois prison, one says the other, you know, the food was a lot better when you were governor. <laughs> we don't want America to continue to go in the wrong direction like the state of Illinois. Four years ago, Iowans actually took some pride in launching Barack Obama's political prominence. Iowans really believed him when he said, we need to look for hope and change in Washington, D.C., but he clearly hasn't delivered. Instead, he's given us massive debt and, and no plan to create jobs. He spends all his time blaming other people and attacking Mitt Romney. Instead of bringing us together, his policies have divided and demonized. He still can't tell us what a second term will be any different than what it is. Iowans feel disappointed. Almost a sense of betrayal to our principles of sound budgeting and responsible government. You know, Iowa has a message for Barack Obama. We're going to change that with this election.
We're going to turn this country around and bring it back for the American dream. You will soon hear from the next president of the United States. And when Mitt Romney becomes president, he will work with Democrats and Republicans and put the interests of the American people first and solve big problems. I know that he can do it because I've seen that he's done it before. He did it as the governor of Massachusetts, a very difficult liberal state with 85 percent of the legislature controlled by Democrats. And yet, for four years, he balanced the budget without raising taxes. He rescued the scandal-plagued 2002 Winter Olympics by overhauling its leadership, trimming its budget, and regaining the public's trust. In the private sector, where he's had great experience, he helped start great successful companies like Sports Authority and Staples that have created thousands of jobs and created wealth all across America. Never before has either party given us a candidate for president that better understood how to create private sector jobs in America. That's why I am proud to enthusiastically support Mitt Romney for president and I'm proud to welcome the next President of the United States, Mitt Romney. My goodness, thank you so much. What an honor to be with you today. And it is, uh, it is quite an honor to be able to be on the stand and, and see your governor. Talk about a winner. I don't know how many. He's run 14 times for governor, one every time. But, but uh, to be with Dan Gable, gosh, that's, uh, that's really extraordinary. I mean, uh, someone said he's the... Uh, no, he, uh, Michael Jordan is the Dan Gable of basketball, and uh, <laughs> this guy is a national name and a hero, and uh, Iowa has a history in, in wrestling, and uh, what, what an honor to be with him and to be with someone who's made such an impact in the sport, and thank you for your willingness to join with me today and to, to be able to talk about the big challenges that America faces. This is a big election, and this is a critical time, and I appreciate your coming out and spending a little time with me and with my friends today. Now, you've heard from Chairman Priebus, and you heard from Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds, and you've had the chance to, I know, get to know John Archer, who's a candidate for Congress. We want to make sure John gets elected again, and we want to also want to take a moment before we begin and just uh, just think about what's happening on the coast, the, uh, the east coast of our country right now. There, I, I was speaking today with the National Weather Service and with folks at FEMA as they're preparing for the landfall of a very, uh, very dangerous uh, hurricane. It's going to affect a lot of families. It already has. And, uh, and the, uh, the damage will probably be uh, significant. And of course, a lot of people will be out of power for a long time. And so hopefully your thoughts and prayers will join with mine and, and people across the country as you think about those folks that are in harm's way. And uh, by the way, the American Red Cross is, of course, accepting donations. And if you have a little extra, you can send off to the American Red Cross. Why join us in doing that and make sure we do our very best to help those that are that are being impacted by the storm. We, uh, we love our fellow Americans. Wish them well. Now, this is quite a turnout for a sod farm. I got to tell you, this is, uh, this is really amazing. You guys are... I mean, you guys are used to campaigns. I mean, Iowa is always in the center of things year after year after year. And for you to nonetheless be out here today and spend some time with me is really something. And, and it shows across the country, by the way, and across Iowa. I, I, I keep going across the state everywhere I go, big crowds, enthusiasm. 
attention being focused on this campaign, and I think it's because people recognize that this is a this is a big election. Th this election is going to have is going to have major impact, not just for four years, but for for a generation, because the country faces right now some very large challenges, and by the way, some big opportunities as well. Challenges, you know, massive debt, unwillingness on the part of the politicians in Washington to actually deal with the challenges. They say to be gridlocked, just locked in concrete. They can't take on the massive deficit that we have, and it threatens the future of our country. At the same time, they, they haven't been able to get the economy going. We've gone four years now with 23 million people struggling to find a good job. And of course, middle-income families have been crushed across the country by falling incomes and, and rising costs. So th this is a tough time for the country. And then around the world, we face a, a, a new series of competitors like China that's going to be a very, already is a major economic competitor, will, but will continue to be such. And then on a, a more dangerous note, of course, the jihadists are spreading throughout uh, not just northern Africa and Middle East, but other parts of the world. So there are major challenges. Opportunities abound as well, because we're the most productive people in the world. We, we make more stuff per person than anybody else in the world. And that means if we can get trade right, we can sell agriculture products, manufactured products, services all over the world, particularly in Latin America, if we can take down some of the trade barriers that keep us from being able to get in those markets. So there's a big opportunity for America. And I want to make sure we, we finally confront the challenges and, and, and seize those opportunities. But for that to happen, we're going to have to have leadership in Washington that recognize the significance of this time and seize this as a as a turning point. See, the president happens to think we're already on the right track. Everything's going fine. His campaign slogan is forward, all right? I don't think we're on the right path. I want to take a new path and get America strong again, and I will. His people are all going all over the country uh, shouting, four more years. Our slogan is, our slogan is eight more days, all right? And I'm... And by, by the way, we'll, we'll have to come up with a new slogan tomorrow. Uh, You know, <laughs> you know, the difference between where I would lead this country and where the president's leading it could not be more stark, in my view. Because I happen to believe if he were to be reelected, why, well, you'd see roughly $20 trillion in government debt at the end of the next four years. If I'm elected, we're going to get America on track to finally having a balanced budget. If he were to be reelected, you're going to see $716 billion cut out of Medicare. And if I'm reelected, I'm, or elected rather, I'm going to take that $716 billion, put it back in Medicare to make sure we honor the promises made to seniors. If he were reelected, I think you have to brace yourself for higher taxes. He's always already raised taxes by a trillion dollars. He's on track to raise them $2 trillion, particularly on small businesses like this one right here, although this is b bigger than a real small business, <laughs> and, and, uh, and on individuals. There's no question he will raise taxes. Raising taxes costs jobs. A an independent analysis was done of how many jobs would be lost through his tax plan. It's about 700,000 jobs. I'll tell you this. If I'm elected president, I will not raise taxes on middle-income Americans, and I'll run, not raise taxes on small business. I want to get jobs here. And the governor, the governor said something that, that is absolutely right on. And, and that is that, that if he were reelected, there's no question but that you continue to see gridlock in Washington. He said, as you may recall, just a few weeks ago, famously, he said, you can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. We want to give him that chance. All right, that's a... I want to change it from the inside, 
And I know what you have to do to do that. And that is you have to be willing to reach across the aisle and find good Democrats who, by the way, love America just like Republicans do. Find common ground. There is common ground between us. Look for relationships where we can build respect and rapport with one another, find common ground, and finally get America on track to the kind of economic growth that the people of America deserve and demand. And so I look at this election as a turning point, and I look at this as a, at a time, as a time when, when we need real change, big change. We need to take a new course, and so on day one, I'll propose real change. One of the things I'll do on day one is this. I'm going to make sure that we propose getting our corporate tax rates down, the tax rates on small business down. Now, you might ask why. You might say, why do that? Well, let me tell you. Do you realize the Europeans, they used to have higher taxes than we did on companies. Some years ago, back in the 70s, why their tax rates were almost 50% on businesses. Ours were high like that, too. We brought ours down. They keep bringing theirs down further, though. They brought their tax rate down to 25% on businesses. Ours, ours is at 35%. Now, let me tell you what that does. That causes some of those big companies that build big factories to go elsewhere, to go places where the taxes are lower. Canada figured this out. They've lowered their tax rate on businesses to 15%. So we're here at 35%. They're at 15%. Guess what that means when a major company is thinking about expanding a facility? They look at Canada and think how much they can save, how many more products they can make, how much better of a return they can give to their shareholders. We want to be competitive, so I want to bring those rates down. By the way, I'm going to cut the company's deductions and exemptions and credits so they, they continue to pay as much in taxes, but we get the rates down so we're more competitive. And for small business, Small business doesn't pay taxes like corporations. They pay taxes like individuals. They're taxed at the individual rate. So I want to lo lower tax rates on individuals across the board by 20% so small business and big business stays here, grows, and adds jobs. I've got a plan to get this country going again, to get our economy going. It's got five major parts. And I think you know mostly what they are, but let me just remind you of them. Twelve million jobs come from this plan. Twelve million jobs. Rising take-home pay. Five parts. Number one, take full advantage of our oil, our coal, our gas, our nuclear renewables. Make sure we use our energy. That creates energy jobs. It brings manufacturing back. And by the way, build a pipeline from Canada. Let's get that oil and not have it go overseas. I also want to make sure, number two, that we, we open up trade, particularly in Latin America. I think we can do better. Latin America's economy is almost as big as that of, of China. We're all focused on China and opportunities there. Don't forget what's right here in our backyard. Let's do more trade with Latin America. We can sell a lot of products there. That's number two. And by the way, if nations cheat in trade, you've got to stop them. You can't let them get away with stealing our jobs with unfair labor practices. Number three, got to make sure we have good training programs to give our workers the skills they need, and we have to have schools. Look, it, it's just, it's unacceptable to me that the nation that invented public education should, uh, should have schools now performing in the bottom third or bottom quarter of the, of the world. We're not going to lead the world if our kids don't have the kinds of educations that they, like education that they need to, to compete. And so... To fix our schools, I, I, I won't take you through all of it, but let me tell you simply what has to be done. We've got to make sure we put our kids and their parents and the teachers first, and the teachers' union is going to have to go behind. We've got to, we've got to put our kids first. Number four, I'm going to balance the budget, but number five, or get us on that track, and number five, number five, we've got to champion small business in this country. We've got to help small businesses grow and thrive so they're able to add more employment. And we do that by holding down taxes. We do that by, by getting regulators to see business as their friend, not their enemy. You see, I think there are a lot of people who wonder whether the current administration likes small business or business at all. I like business, all right? I like the jobs that businesses create. I want to encourage business, make them more successful. And by the way, for... For small, for small business to, to really start hiring again, we're going to have to take that big cloud 
away that's keeping them from hiring in many cases. And that big cloud is Obamacare. I'm going to repeal it and replace it with real reform that helps to hold down the cost of health care. All that's going to happen by reaching across the aisle. I'll meet regularly with Democrat leadership, Republican leadership, work for the common interest of the people of America, put the interest of the people ahead of the interest of the politicians. But I also want you to know how optimistic I am. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I were a pessimist, all right? All right, this, uh, this job is quite an undertaking. It's a thrill to get to do what I get to do and to see people across the country like I get to see you today. You can't imagine. I, I get so much energy from you that, by the way, at the end of the day, I, it takes a long time for me to slow down and fall asleep, all right? I love what I get to do. I'm, I'm so excited about the American people. We're an extraordinarily optimistic, energetic, entrepreneurial, innovative, can-do people. And, and, and that's, that's one of the things that makes America so unique. There's something else it does. We as a people and we as individuals tend to live for something bigger than ourselves. There, there's, a, there's a term for, for a hero. They say a hero is, it doesn't have to be someone who's bigger than life, just bigger than himself. And the American people live for something other than themselves. Typically their family, perhaps their church, their school, university, their community, their country. I, uh, some years ago, was, uh, was able to think about the connection between the American people and the, the greatness of this land and our heritage and how we live for things bigger than ourselves. I saw some of the great qualities of the human spirit when I was serving as a leader in the Boy Scouts of America. I had the chance to go. I see a Boy Scout right there. He was ready to applaud. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the Scouts and the and those Scout leaders. I, I was at the I was at a Formica table uh, at the front of the the uh, gymnasium where we had a a Boy Scout Court of Honor, and a Court of Honor is where the the Scouts come to get their Eagle Scout awards or their other awards, and uh, and I was seated at the end of the table next to the American flag, and the person at the podium was the scoutmaster from Monument, Colorado. And he was describing his Boy Scouts' uh, interest in having a very special flag. They bought one with gold tassels around the outside. They sent it off to the Capitol to fly above the Capitol. Then when it came home, they decided that it should go on the space shuttle. So they contacted NASA and said, would you take our, our flag on the space shuttle? Now, I can imagine that space in the space shuttle is somewhat limited. But NASA agreed. They took the boy's space or, uh, flag on the shuttle, and he said, you can imagine the, uh, the pride of the boys as they're in their home schools at watching TV screen, home school room, and looking at the, the shuttle launch of the shuttle Challenger, and then they saw it explode on the TV before their eyes. And he said he called NASA and said, have you, have you found any remnant of our flag? They had not. And he called, he said, every week for months, have you found part of our flag? Nothing. And then he was reading an article some months later. And in the article, it said that uh, a number of pieces of debris from the Challenger disaster had been recovered, and they mentioned a flag. So he called NASA again. And they said, in fact, we have a presentation to make to your boys. And so NASA came together with the, the Boy Scout troop, and he said they presented us with this plastic container. We opened it up, and there was our flag in perfect condition. And uh, he said, it's on the flagpole right there next to Mr. Romney. And I, uh, I looked at it and reached over and grabbed it and pulled it out. And it was as if electricity was flowing through my arm. As I thought about the members of our space program and how they walk in danger's way, for us, for learning, for knowledge, exploring, pioneering, bigger than themselves. I think of our men and women in the armed services who put themselves in harm's way for us, for liberty, for freedom. There's a verse, you know, we, we, uh, we sing that song, America the Beautiful, and we, we talk about the rocks and rills and templed hills and purple mountains, majesty, and, and so forth, but uh, it's the later verses that touch me more. One verse says, O beautiful for heroes, proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. 
Would our veterans please raise your hands and members of the armed forces and be recognized. Thank you, sir. Other people serve in other ways, uh, things bigger than themselves. I, uh, I think of my sister Lynn. Uh, Lynn's in her 70s. Her husband passed away a few years ago. She has eight kids, and seven of the eight are married and have children of their own. The eighth was born Down syndrome. He's now 43. And Lynn devotes her life to caring for this 43-year-old, has her in all those 43 years, cared for him to make sure he has as full and complete a life as he possibly can. She's a hero to me. She lives for something bigger than herself, her child. I think of the single moms across America that are struggling to make ends meet right now and uh, making sure they scrimp and save so they can put a good meal on the table at the end of the day for their kids. And the dads that are, well, and moms too, that are working two jobs or couples that one works the day shift and the other works the night shift and hardly have time to see each other, but they do this so their kids can have the same kind of clothes that other kids have and don't stand out at school. Think of all the couples last Christmas and probably this Christmas who say, let's not exchange gifts between us, but instead make sure we have enough for our kids to enjoy Christmas. We're, we're, a, uh, we're a people given to big things. We are, uh, we're a people of full heart. We care very deeply about our country and our families and the things that are most meaningful. We're a people also with clear eyes. We understand the significance of the events around us. The fact that you're here today, I mean, there are a lot of other things you could be doing, but you're interested. You, you want to see what's happening and understand who I am and what I, what I might do if I'm president. And I, and I, I, I recall a, uh, a line in a fictional football team show. It was called Friday Night Lights. You probably didn't see it, but you did, all right? She saw it. They, they had this fictional football team. And every time they'd leave the locker room, and they typically were facing long odds, there was this sign up there. It said, uh, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. And I'm convinced that the people of Iowa have very clear eyes about what's at stake in this election. And I know you have full hearts. And I'm convinced America can't lose when you help me become the next president of the United States. Thanks, you guys. You are the best. Thank you for your help. Thank you so very much. We're going to keep America the great hope of the earth. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.